topic in scripture? Is it justification by faith? Is it the creation of this universe, which is really only made difficult by people believing what modern day science has told them? Is it the proper work and worship of the church? Or is it what, hap or is it what happens when Christ comes again? No. While these topics may have some difficult aspects to them, the most difficult topic revealed to us in scripture is about God himself. In Isaiah chapter 55, verses 6 to 9, we read, Seek the Lord while he, may, while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your, my, your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For all of the progress that we have made as a civilization, for all the knowledge we have obtained, it is a drop in the bucket compared to the knowledge of God. We keep looking for cures for the different types of diseases. God holds the germ within his hand and knows how to defeat it. We keep looking into the mysteries of how this universe works. God has a complete understanding because he made it. His knowledge is so far above ours that if we knew what he knew, our heads probably would explode. Like it is with his knowledge, his wisdom surpasses our wisdom too. When we do things, we can only do so based on our own experience. And oftentimes we fail to see the consequences of all our actions and what they're going to be in the future. When God sees something, he can see the results of his actions that cascade through time. God prophesied of the death of Jesus thousands of years before it happened. The Pharisees hadn't even been born yet. Neither had Pontius Pilate, neither had Judas. Only two people existed on this earth when God first made that prophecy. Yet through his wisdom and power, he knew what he could accomplish. Listen to the sheer awesomeness of the true God of this universe. Turn if you would to Psalms. 139. Psalms 139. We're going to start reading at verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they are all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. That passage doesn't put mankind in our place when it comes to comparing ourselves to God, then I don't know what will. God is our creator, and he sees us in our mother's womb before we are fully formed. Just as a side note in passing, this shows us that we are people before we are born. We are not a, simply a fetus 
that we have the right to destroy at will. For God knows who we are before we are born. God not only sees us before we are born, he sees us after we are born. Everything we do, we do before God. And there is not anything that we can keep hidden from him. We cannot run away from God, for he is everywhere. He is truly an all-wise, all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present God. Now compare this God to the so-called gods that we know that people worship today or have worshipped in the past, and you're going to see an enormous difference. Now what is that difference? Well, the difference is that people don't worship one God. They worship many gods. Each culture had its own set of gods, each with their own names and their own set of powers. In Greek mythology, there is Zeus, the god of the sky and the god of thunder. There is Hercules, the god of strength. There is Athena, the goddess of wisdom, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love, and those are just four. There are many more. In Norse mythology, there is Thor, the god of thunder, Odin, the god of wisdom, and Freya, the goddess of love and beauty, and of course there are more of those as well. You could examine Roman culture, Canaanite culture, Hittite culture, Babylonian culture, and many other cultures, and you will find the same thing. Now these gods are not merely different peoples worshiping the same gods, but calling them by a translated name. These gods were actually different beings from culture to culture, and each had their own backstory. When different nations went to war with each other, they called on their gods to defeat the gods of their opponents. They were not the same gods. Taking a closer look at these gods, we each find that they each had their own sphere of influence and their own special powers. By sphere of influence, I mean they had a certain part that they were in control of, like the water or the mountains or the valleys. That's what I mean by sphere of influence. And they had their own special powers. Take, for example, Odin and Thor. Now, to superhero fans, these names might sound familiar to you because of the Marvel movies in the recent years. But the stories that were told in those movies, though heavily altered, are adapted from Norse mythology. Odin is not the god of thunder. Thor is. Thor is not the god of wisdom. Odin is. They both have different ambitions, different temperaments, and they're worshipped in different ways. They both were born, and they die. They both do good things and bad things. They are nothing like the God of the Bible. They are like men and women. They possess human features, they act in human ways, and make human mistakes. These gods were made in our image. They were created by man for man. Now, having now look quickly at these worldly gods, let's take a closer look at the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is never described as many, but as one. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, we read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, in that passage, Moses is speaking before the children of Israel entered the promised land. He is reiterating to them their law that they received at Mount Sinai and their responsibilities once they entered the promised land. In a specific context, Moses is comparing the true God of heaven with the gods of the Canaanites. In verses 12 to 15 of the same chapter, Moses said, Then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the people who are, all, who are all around you, for the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. The true God of this universe is different to the gods created by men and women in this world. The New Testament describes this God the same way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 to 6, Paul writes, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and there is no other God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, 
Yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ through whom are all things, and through whom we live. Like the passage in Deuteronomy, Paul, too, is comparing God to the idols of this world and declares that there is but one God that deserves to be worshipped. And because this God is one, he has specific attributes which distinguish him from the gods of this world. First of all, he is eternal. In Exodus chapter 3, Exodus chapter 3, uh, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, he gave Moses his name in verse 14. What was that name? I am who I am. Now to us, that might sound like a strange name. But that's because the English translation takes away some of the beauty of what was said, even though it portrays the correct meaning. In Hebrew, it reads, Haya Asher Haya, which actually is the meaning of God's name, which is Jehovah or Yahweh, depending on how you wish to say it. If you notice in your Bibles, you often find that the word Lord especially in Exodus 3.14, is in all caps. There are all capital letters. It's not capital L, lowercase o-r-d. It's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's because in the Hebrew, you're going to find the word Adonai there, which literally means Lord. However, the reason you find Adonai, and, the, and then in English, the word Lord in all caps, is because when referring to God, the Hebrews never wrote the name of God, which is spelled in English Y-H-W-H, -H, and pronounced in the Hebrew as Yahweh, or in English as Jehovah. They did that for, because they feared that they were going to take the name of the Lord in vain. So instead, they wrote Adonai everywhere they found Y-H-W-H. -H. An example of that is in verse 7 of Exodus 3, which said, And the Lord, all caps, said. It should say, And Jehovah said. Coming back to verse 14, I am who I am is the meaning of Jehovah, or Yahweh, and it means the eternal, unchanging one. God was not born. He does not die. Nor does he change in the sense that he changes who he is. He is the same God in Genesis chapter 1 that he is in Revelation chapter 22. There is no God of the Old Testament, and then the different God of the New Testament. He is the same God. As we read in Psalms 139 earlier, the God of the Bible is omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, and om omnipresent, ever-present. And he is not like man either. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 27 to 29, listen to the words of Samuel. And as Samuel turned away, turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and tore. So Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of you from Israel from you today, and has given to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. God is not like us. He doesn't lie to save his own reputation. He always tells the truth. He does not sin in other ways either, and in, in is in need of repentance. He is perfectly righteous and holy. His love is perfect. His justice is perfect. His motives are perfect, and his ways are perfect. And he will not accept man on our terms. He will only accept us on his terms. In that regard, he is not like man in any way. But just as he is not like man, he is also not like this earth. In Acts chapter 17, Paul's standing on Mars Hill, and he sees all of these idols that the Greeks worship. Listen to what he said in Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 22. Men of Athens, I perceive in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything, 
since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Now, mankind is very visual people. We have trouble understanding abstract concepts like love. So we create symbols of love, like the shape of a heart, even though our shape of a heart looks nothing like the human heart. But the reason we make that shape is because love is supposed to come from the heart. But the God of the universe cannot be reduced to some carving or painting that we make because he is the one who created all things. He created this earth and everything in it. He created mankind, placed us on this earth and controls our lifespans. It is impossible for us to represent God in anything that we could create, which is why he doesn't desire us to. He wants us to worship him, though we cannot see him physically with our eyes, we can know he exists by what we see. In our worship, he wants us to put him in his proper place, which is above us and above this universe. And he wants us to worship him because of what he has done for us, not because of what we have done for him, which is in fact nothing. There is only one God in this universe, and that is Jehovah, the creator of all things. And yet, even though the Bible is very clear on the fact that there is only one God, in numerous places, it tells us that there is more than one person or being known as God. We don't have to look very far in our Bibles to understand this. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, we read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the, all the cattle over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The Hebrew word for God in that verse is Elohim, speaking of the supreme God of the universe. In that passage, though, the word Elohim isn't singular. In Hebrew, it is plural. That's why in English it reads, let us make man in our image and not let me make man in my image. The only way there can be an us in this passage is if there are at least two beings known as God. Read through the scripture and you will in fact find that there are three separate beings referred to as God. You will find God the Father. For in Matthew 6 verse 9, Jesus said, In this manner, therefore pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This person of the Godhead is the one who devised creation and the redemption plan and is, is described as supreme or over everything. We get that from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 20, Paul writes, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as an Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after those who are, those afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now I know that passage can be difficult to understand, but on a simple to understand level, we can take away from this that God the Father is preeminent 
above all in the Godhead. Now that doesn't make the other members of the Godhead inferior to God the Father or lesser gods. It just means they have different roles. Usually in Scripture, when we read of God, we are reading of God the Father. However, this isn't always true, for Jesus is also described as God. In John 8, verse 58, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus takes the name Jehovah unto himself that we read in Exodus chapter 3. And he said that before Abraham was, I am. We don't have to wonder if that's what Jesus meant. For the very next verse in John says that the people were going to take up stones to cast at him for blasphemy. Now, I cannot say before Abraham was, I am, for I was not. I was born on July the 4th, 1983. Approximately nine months prior to that date, I was conceived, and before that time, I was not. The same can be said of you and whenever your birthday was. Not so with Jesus. He was saying that he was the eternal, unchanging one. The role that Jesus plays in the Godhead, among other things, is he is our Savior. In Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14, we read, But the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Paul calls Jesus God in that passage, but he also refers to Jesus as our Savior. While God the Father could be called our Savior as well, he did not die on the cross for our sins. Jesus did. That is the distinction that we need to make sure we are clear on in our minds. Because God the Father did not die on the cross. Jesus did. So God the Father is called God. Jesus Christ is called God. We also find one other person referred to as God in the scriptures, and that is the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 5, in Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 4, there are Luke writes, but a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Now, in verse 3, Peter said to Ananias that he lied to the Holy Spirit. Well, in verse 4, he said Ananias lied to God. Peter is not referring to two separate entities there, for the Holy Spirit is not in this world. The unescapable conclusion, therefore, is that the Holy Spirit is God. Throughout the Bible, the Holy Spirit, sometimes referred to as the Spirit of God, is seen with the same attributes of God. We read so earlier in Psalms 139. What is his role in the Godhead? To reveal or testify to us all things. There it is. To reveal or to testify to us all things that are of God. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12, Paul writes, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. For what, uh, even so, no one knows the spirit of God except the spirit of God. For we have not received, sorry, we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. I cannot know one thing about the will of God unless the Spirit reveals it to me. That was true in the first century. It is true today. However, the way the Holy Spirit reveals God's Word is different to how He revealed it in the first century. In the first century, He revealed God's will to men through prophets. These prophets 
did not have the entire will of God except the apostles. They only had pieces of it, hence why many prophets were needed. However, some of these men will be inspired to write the will of God down so that it can be passed on through the generations. Men like Paul and Luke and Matthew and Peter and James and John did that. And so that's why we have the Bible today. However, when I read the Bible, it is still the Holy Spirit revealing to me the will of God. He is just doing so through the Word rather than by direct revelation. We all have access to the entire Word of God, making what we have superior to that of former times, but we don't have to wonder if something is the will of God. We can know. With all of this being true, though, with God existing in three persons or three beings, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, how can it be said that God is one? Well, first, because all three share all of the characteristics of God. Remember earlier when I spoke of Odin and Thor? Each had their own sphere of influence and their own special powers. All the members of the Godhead, though separate in person, all have the same characteristics. All are eternal. We've read already where God the Father and Jesus Christ claim that for themselves in Exodus chapter 3.14 and John chapter 8.58. But the Holy Spirit is eternal as well. For in Hebrews 9.14 we find, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? None of the members of the Godhead had a beginning, and none of them have an end. They have always existed. All of them all-knowing, all of them all-powerful, and all of them all-present. Moreover, they are one because they act as one. They are united. Odin and Thor didn't act as one. They acted as two. They didn't agree with each other. Each did his own thing. All the members of the God had act as one despite being three beings or persons. In John chapter 10, listen to what Jesus said, starting in verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, and because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, You are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into this world, You are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do, though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. How was Jesus, who at the time he spoke those words, being here on this earth, one with the Father, who at that time was in heaven? Because the works Jesus did testify of the will of the Father. And the Father testified of the deity of Jesus Christ through those same works. If Jesus was not who he said he was, he wouldn't be able to perform anything. For those miracles were only possible through God's power. Jesus and the Father were one because they were united in action. They were also united in purpose. In John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23, listen to the prayer of Jesus. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the word world may believe that you sent me, 
And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. The mission that Jesus was sent on was one devised by the Father, but Jesus came to this earth willingly. In John 10, 14 to 18, we find that he willingly gave his life for the sheep. Nobody took his life away from him, for he had the power to lay it down, and he had the power to take it up again. The same could be said of the Holy Spirit. In John chapters 14, 15, and 16, Jesus tells the apostles that after he dies, is resurrected, and then ascends to heaven, that the Holy Spirit would come to guide them into all truth. Like Jesus, the Holy Spirit was sent, but he came under his own volition, or his own free will. Nobody forced the Holy Spirit to come. That is what we're talking about when we speak about the oneness of God. The three persons of the Godhead work so closely with one another that you can't really tell that there are three persons at all, for they act as one. There is another relationship, though, an earthly relationship, that is described in a very similar way. And that's the husband and the wife. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 to 6, we read, And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. The, the, the idea of marriage is to be that two people are no longer to act as two people any longer. They are to act as one. They are to be perfectly joined with one another. They are to love each other as one. They are to raise their children as one. They are to behave as one. They are to worship as one. Sadly, this is not an ideal that many couples attain to, and a dysfunctional marriage is a testament to it. Couples fight with each other constantly. They don't share the money that they earn. Each is out to show up the other person. They don't have the same goals resulting in their children playing one parent off the other. That is not how God wants us to act. God wants us to pattern our marriage after the relationship that each of the three members of the Godhead have with each other. They don't compete with each other for their own territory. They don't have different ambitions. They are completely united in, perfect, in purpose and in action and love not only for each other, but for mankind itself. That is why God sent Jesus. That is why Jesus came and died, and that's why the Holy Spirit revealed to us God's will so that we could be saved. So while the topic of God can be difficult, it is not impossible to understand what God has revealed to us. He exists as three separate beings, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Each person of the Godhead is equally God and have all the powers of God, yet serve different roles. God the Father is supreme. Jesus Christ is our Savior, the one who died on the cross for our sins. And the Holy Spirit is our helper, the one who reveals to us the will of God through the scriptures. Yet while they are three beings, they are one God, united in purpose and action which is manifested to us through their common love that they have for us. This is the God that we worship. And this is the only God that can save us from our sins and grant us eternal life. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to